It's time for this week in the Lakeville Journal. I know we have Cynthia Hosswinder on the line. Good morning, Cynthia. Good morning. There is actually a tree down on wires on Dugway Road, which is near Janet's house. And um, I just got here the second before the phone rang, so it's possible she doesn't have... Well, I'm on. There she is. She, she, maybe she doesn't know it yet, but here she but is. There you go. Well, we could Bad lose. news, Janet. Don't make a left out of your drive. Uh, I guess we could lose you at any time, Janet, but what the heck? We've got what you now, heck? so we'll, we'll right. just count on it. Yeah. Glad oh. to be here. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go uh, right to uh, the uh, Lakeville Journal. And uh, actually, some, some pretty interesting stories developed this week when it's normally a pretty quiet time. First of all, uh, the big story, once again, uh, COVID vaccinations, uh, the new schedule set up by the governor, uh, and also there's now uh, a line where you can call and you can get people in Connecticut to schedule those appointments for you. Uh, but uh, a this lot is, of people were put off by yeah. the VAMS website and the registration process. Yep. And um, I think Janet, you were saying that one of our um, our former staff members had called up that number, and she got. I think she she was like a three hours after they announced that her age group was allowed she was already scheduled so we're looking forward to um monday which is the age 55 beginning and you can't register online yet they won't they won't allow you to but i'm i'm thinking that probably if you keep checking over the next couple of days at a certain point they'll start to let age 55 but i think um again kudos to governor lamont for being as as good with sharing information as anybody can be in a situation like this, but I think based on um, comments that people were making to me over the last couple of months, a lot of it was just nobody knew what the schedule was going to be. Like, when were they going to be um, allowed to, to register for their age group for the vaccine? So it, even if we're not exactly, like, to the minute able to stick to the schedule, I think people would be very happy to know more or less what the future is going to hold. All right. Now, this is a story that normally wouldn't be a big story, but because Falls Village is so far away from convenience stores and from gas stations. Uh, the filling station uh, at Route 7 and 63 has finally opened up, and that is a big convenience for people in Falls Village. It's a big deal, especially because Falls Village doesn't really have any yeah. retail. And a lot of people either you know, either go to Torrington or go to Salisbury or go to Stop and Shop for their groceries, but no matter how you cut it, it's about a 20-minute drive to get milk. And for gosh sakes, you have to drive 20 minutes to get gas. Yeah, right. And, you know, people yeah. just traveling on Route 7 or Route 63 who are unfamiliar with the area can't believe how far they had to go where they couldn't get gas. They would stop at our office and say, where's the closest gas station? You know, yeah. we saw this place, well, but it's closed. You've got to go to Canaan or, or you've got to go to Cornwall. It well, not, any, not anymore. Yay. Not anymore. And sandwiches. And, I, you know, I it's it's a funny little uh, photo portrait that Patrick took of the new owner. But, gosh, doesn't he look happy? And, uh, you know, who, who can blame him? It was a long, bumpy road to get that gas station open. There were a lot of um, problems with, There's I guess, dance. with the soil and with red tape. And they're finally open, and um, let's all support them. A pretty important story that uh, has been, uh, I've heard rumblings around here. We're going to be speaking with Mark Herto, I do believe, on Friday. Um, but there have been several people that have contacted us uh, concerned uh, about changes uh, at the Sharon Hospital, not in the hospital itself, but the setup of the board. And the board is being very laid back about, oh, this is just a nominal change for Kentelli from Salisbury Bank and Trust, who, who is generally a pretty straightforward guy, says in this article um, written by Patrick Sullivan. It's, it's nothing to worry about. It's very straightforward. But if you just look at it, it does seem like a big change to go from, I think it's 12 members to one member. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really good that people are keeping an eye on the hospital. There have been a lot of changes um, since New Vance took over, I think generally people have been pleased with it. I think generally people like Dr. Herco and feel like he, he again, a very straightforward person. Um, but uh, always good to keep an eye on these things. And the story about the trash and residents, full-time residents, you know, we are here at the northwest corner are facing a convergence of events that it's going to make disposing our trash very expensive. It's more people, more trash, and there's no place now really to take the trash. They're going to have to find a new place in the state, which is going to rise costs as well. Really interesting pair of stories from Leela Hawken from Cornwall, which is the first, I think they're the farthest along in their budget process of any of our, our six towns, I believe, and had a long and detailed conversation about how trash disposal is impacting the town budget plan for the coming year. And very specific numbers from their transfer station where there's basically two guys working full time and they're only open a couple days a week. 
and they've gone from, I think they've quadrupled the amount of cardboard that they're processing every week and roughly about the same amount of garbage and, you know, still the same guys, so four times as much work, um, two same people. And the cost to the towns to dispose of all of that, and, a lot, you know, because more people are living up here full-time because of COVID and also because everybody's ordering so much more of their product online, so there's all this cardboard and packaging that everybody's dealing with. So they're trying to figure out ways in Cornwall, which takes pride in the fact that it's got such a high recycle rate and is a very clean, green town, trying to figure out ways to cope with this. And I think that we're going to see this in all of our towns because, Marshall, as you said, it's not just the increased pressure on our transfer stations, but we've been seeing this sort of rolling up toward us for the last five years or so as, as recycling has become more complex as China has refused to take a lot more of our um, trash. And I think as more and more of us, you know, use more plastic and use more plastic bottles and, you know, buy more stuff. I saw a story in the national news about how in uh, the in the cities and the poor communities uh, with COVID-19, the way that they were uh, uh, trying to fix their, vent- their ventilation of the classrooms was to put these uh, small uh, things that you buy at your home, the fans, and put fans in the window that uh, brought air in and brought air out, which really uh, does not work well at all. But we here uh, in Region 1 uh, have put a lot of effort uh, into actually uh, circulating the air uh, at the high school, uh, and, and I think we're doing the, doing it the proper way. Right, and they, they got a million-dollar grant at the high school to get these air exchangers in um, they, as of February 17th, they were delayed for a week, so probably they're, they're there already. But, um, yeah, I, I, I can't think how many people I've had dinner with over the last year who said, I can't really come over unless you've got some kind of air circulation in the room. And I guess that's the same question with, with airplanes, is, is the air circulation good enough? But um, good to see that they're, they're thinking on their feet there and trying to keep our students safe. You know, it's one thing we have here at the radio station that was put in back in 1986 when all the renovations were done here. Uh, There is an air handler that is separate that continues the flow of outside air, inside, and then back outside. That was done uh, back in 1986. And and that's the type of system that you're talking about where it's the natural flow of of air. And I think it's going to be one of the more important things in in our schools in the area to get the schools back back to operation as quick as possible. Well, and even in a post-COVID world, most new buildings that are built are built so tight that there's no natural yep. airflow, and a lot of the products that, that we're using are chemically treated in one way or another. So there's a lot more toxic air in our homes. So an air handler like you guys have in your building is really a great innovation. All right. You know, I, I love historic pictures, and I love the picture of the toll bridge of the high water, and uh, then the story by Patrick Sullivan, uh, really with Bernie Drew, about uh, electric power in, the, in our region. I was going to say, it's a Patrick Sullivan story, but really it's a Bernie Drew story. Yeah. And Bernie, of course, beloved, longtime Lake Fed Journal staff member, but also a beloved local historian. And, you know, as we've lost a lot of our really big names in local history with Ed Kirby and Ron Jones, it, you know, we really have to treasure people like Dick Paddock and Bernie Drew who are still here doing all this interesting work and also carrying around all this information in their heads that they've often found you know, through first-person research, digging through records, which is how Bernie does a lot of his research. So talking, you know, and of course, it's just an interesting story that Bernie made very lively, which is the choice between AC power and DC power. Um, And as you said, a great photo of the uh, bridge that used to be in North Canaan. Really, the water is really washing right over that bridge. It's one of those pictures uh, uh, that you look at and then you say, and then you look at the area now and how it's changed and how everything's changed. It's uh, it's one of those stark things that time marches on, and and uh, you have to appreciate the past, I guess, to appreciate the future as well. Right, and also as we hear what's going on in Texas and the complexity of uh. their power system, and you know, in our power system, we're part of the New England ISO, and so if we ever have a power situation, we can even get you know electricity from from Canada. Um, but interesting, you know, and of course our, our power in Connecticut has been deregulated. So a lot of the issues that are impacting uh, Texas have impacted us in the past. But so far we've done pretty well. Well, don't you remember when we had that snowstorm where the entire state was without power? Uh, for but uh, for, for a week for most of the state, but they got like probably about 50% of the state back up within a day or two because of being on that power grid. And when you go back to the story about Texas, they were literally minutes away from losing the power grid, which would have taken months to restore. 
uh, people sometimes take uh, the power grid uh, for uh, for granted, and especially if you're not associated uh, in being tied in on the national grid. Uh, I want to move on to uh, a couple of stories on page A3. First of all, interesting story with the headline, businesses are thriving, but ash trees are dying. Some people keep saying to me, like, I saw a lot of clear-cutting going on. And I think last year, especially, there was a lot, like, you drive down the road and there would just be a ton of trees being taken down and um, and being mulched, or you would often see guys in pickup trucks on the side of the road cutting it up and taking it home and splitting it. So ash, which burns really nicely, has been um, devastated by the emerald ash borer, which for years they worked very hard to try and keep it out of the region. But the ash borer destroys, um, it plants its larvae underneath the, um, the bark, which is already bad for the tree. But then the woodpeckers come along, and there have been a lot of woodpeckers out. We have a nice one, a photo of one in, um, in an evergreen tree in this week's paper. But the the woodpeckers come in and they dig in through the bark of the tree to get the larvae. And so the combination of that is the trees die. So we've had a massive die off of ash trees. I believe there was just a big ash tree clear cutting up in um, North Canaan about a couple weeks ago. So um, North Canaan Board of Selectmen talking about these ash trees that are dying. And of course, North Canaan unexpectedly is one of the most environmentally aware towns. Like a lot of um, really knowledgeable people, Tom Zedestrom and Christian Allen, thinking about the trees and thinking about how to protect them. Um, but on the other hand, North Canaan businesses in the center of town have been doing better than they've done in decades. So you've got all sorts of interesting, very forward-thinking businesses. There's the new um, Berkshire Country Cafe, and there's um, a juice and coffee bar coming up. A lot of interesting gut stuff going on, uh, not just antique stores. And to show you how expensive it is to run a town, we all know that uh, when uh, our ambulance services have to replace their ambulances, they're in, uh, up in the range of a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, if not more. Well, in Sharon, once again, just for a loader, I mean, you're looking at a hundred and forty to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, and a lot of times the towns are buying secondhand. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know. You always feel like. You know, everybody's going to want, like, a Ford or something really straightforward. Every meeting I've ever been to, they really do like um, these sort of exotic brands or exotic to me. They, so in Sharon, they love the Volvo equipment, and um, they want to. They have the majority of their town's equipment is Volvo, and as anybody knows who's had a fleet of anything, it's always good when you can swap parts and uh, share fluids on it. But these, these stories seem very minor to people, I think, when they read the paper, but um, They're not it minor. definitely impacts your, <laughs> your, your life and your, and your taxes, so important to pay attention. And to go along with uh, the, the trash story uh, in Cornwall, the uh, changes of COVID-19, their impact in Cornwall. Right. Again, um, very detailed explanation from Lila. And, you know, essentially two stories that mirror each other, but really very interesting to all of our towns, and I think we're going to be hearing more and more of that. Um, and, you know, Salisbury already is one of the least expensive towns, Salisbury and Sharon, to get a transfer station. Kent already, one of the bigger towns in the area, has already had a much, much more expensive um, transfer station fees and much less access to their transfer station. So it'll be interesting to see how we all cope in the coming weeks, I mean, in the coming years. I, I mean, I'm wondering if we're going to move more toward a regional trash disposal system. Uh, and uh, lots of uh, obituaries and appreciation obituaries, but one that caught my eye was uh, uh, Shirley uh, uh, Shofit. Uh, of course, uh, she moved to Houston with her, her husband. Uh, he passed away, Jake passed away uh, years ago, and she just passed away. But uh, that's one of those names that's associated with this area uh, and uh, brings back lots of great memories from, that, uh, from both Jake and Shirley. Right, and her obituary help. really describes beautifully so many of the things she took part in in this area, you know, um, in partnership with Jake, but uh, on her own as well. Yeah. What a fascinating lady. And nice, uh, a nice letter of appreciation by Steve Blass uh, on Ed Kirby. Yeah, wonderful. Tom Shackman writing about Ron Jones as well. Lots of interesting people in this week. Very sad to lose everybody. Now, Patrick Sullivan has, that, uh, uh, has the story on tributes uh, on canvas to Native American life. This is another one of those things where Zoom allows you to have access to these talks from all over the country. So as a docent from the Smithsonian, and weirdly, I actually have a print of that exact painting, which is now sitting on my dining room table, and I feel like I better put it up. But a really interesting talk about George Catlin, who was a person who grew up um, in the American West. His family was kidnapped by the Indians, um, managed to, excuse me, the Native Americans, um, managed to um, come back into their, um, their family safely but built a, law, a lifelong fascination with Native American culture in this painter who did these wonderful um, prints and paintings, which I actually have a full set of in my basement. And 
you know, how interesting that, that COVID has allowed me to sort of remember this interesting thing in my own basement that I should probably pay more attention to. Now, of course, uh, this is National FFA Week, and Housatonic Valley Regional High School participates in that. We interviewed the president of the Ag Science FFA at the Housatonic Valley Regional High School uh, yesterday. She gave us a nice insight uh, onto the things that it, people don't realize what goes on with the FFA uh, uh, section of Housatonic Valley Regional High School, and uh, and and what a what a respected FFA we have. It's always mentioned when you mention anywhere in our tri-state region as being one of the best uh, in within a 100, 150 mile radius. Can I draw for tuition paying students? Um, yeah, she's a, a great uh, asset to the um, faculty there at HUSI and she worked with the kids to put together this article. It's written by FFA staff and uh, so much support for this program in the general area. Please do take a look at the advertisers in this section and support them the way they support FFA. Now, I want to go to the opinion page because you do have the letter in the opinion page uh, from the new general manager uh, at uh, WSHU. Uh, but along with that, you have a, a, a great editorial talking about local media needs support. I mean, Dennis Jackson, I started a radio station here that I was involved with uh, and then ended up uh, leasing it to WSHU uh, simply because uh, it was not really, really uh, flourishing uh, as it needed to do here. And then uh, SHU has found out that once again, the financial support uh, was not enough to keep it in our area. And uh, Janet and I were talking on the phone after all this came up. Really, if anything, is a slap in the face to people to wake them up that if you want local media, uh, you just can't ex keep expecting to get it for free. Exactly. And um, this, it, it really was surprising to many people, perhaps even to Dennis Jackson and WSHU, how many people in this area still um, felt that WQQQ was part of their community and, you know, their radio station. And they really uh, have responded in a big way to no longer having their regular programming on there. Well, um, they should have expressed themselves with contributions uh, before this. For nine years, uh, QQQ was associated with WSHU um, <clears throat> down in Fairfield, Connecticut, and uh, they, they had to look at it. Um, do read uh, Rima Dale's letter uh, explaining their background and their finances. Um, they had to look at it very carefully, and especially during COVID, all businesses, but especially media, need to look at what they're doing and cut back in different ways. And this is how they were able to do it and remain relatively intact for their primary listenership. And, so. and what people have to realize is not only did they cut their transmission on uh, WQQQ, uh, but they had uh, three other stations that they had the same agreement with that they did the same thing because they have they had to make up a shortfall uh, of millions of dollars, uh, and uh, and and these three stations uh, obviously were were part of that. People just have to understand. It's like uh, when people complain about a paywall for for a newspaper. Uh, us here, we we re rely on grants, donations, uh, and underwriting. We don't exist on an un an un unlimited amount of money. We need that the support not only of people using our services, but saying, you know what, we've got to, we have to support it in whatever way possible. Right, and we did talk about this, Marshall, and still I am not sure if people sort of think, well, it's kind of free, right? It's radio waves, it's free, <laughs> it's, um, but <laughs> it's not free to produce. And uh, if people are accustomed to looking at online uh, news and thinking, well, I get that for free, you know, in some instances uh, on Facebook, et cetera, that are aggregated. Um, well, uh, it's not free. Somebody had to put that together, and that somebody has to eat and pay their taxes and rent. So, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> we need we need support in order to exist, and this is a good example of that. We do a little reminiscing about what WQQQ was when Joe Lavero and Marie Castagna were there as the uh, on-air personalities, and um, yeah, it's hard to believe it was nine years ago, and it's good that Joe is in uh, upstate New York, still on air, and, you know, Marie is still in our community, very active, but um, uh, it, 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 time for a change, and this explains why. All right, lots of letters from Swasa to housing, 
uh, and also uh, to uh, I love the story, uh, the letter about Le- Mises because of the uh, story you did on uh, pizza. Exactly, you know, and this what's more personal than pizza? We know that, and um, so Jim Charlton from uh, Lakeville uh, asked us why Mises Pizza wasn't represented in the story about uh, that Deb Alexinus wrote about uh, whether pizza should become Connecticut state food. So. We had uh, we rarely do editor's notes, but we did for Jim and for Mitzes and for Eddie, and uh, we say we made multiple attempts uh, to contact the owner at, by phone and in person at the restaurant to no avail. So we are asking him here, Eddie, do you think pizza should be the state food of Connecticut? <laughs> by all means, get back to us. All right, and of course, you've a, a, a letter from uh, Michael Clemens about nonprofits not immune to criticism. I can tell you, we know that uh, uh, social right. justice and education for a white community. Uh, by, uh, another great letter. Yeah, we really—it's um, such an array of opinion this week. So we're grateful for it. It's interesting that Craig Tunsing also comes up with a um, opinion that. Lakeville Lake is not the deepest lake in Connecticut, and he makes the argument that it's Lake Saltonstall. So anyone who has a differing opinion, by all means, chime in. All right, and I love the cartoon, uh, Ted Cruz, Not So Proud Boy. I'll just leave it at that so people can find out themselves. That's right. You, you really have to look at it. And don't miss Lisa Wright's column, A Critical Human Right. She's talking about reusing things and recycling them. So it's really interesting. She's going to do a little series on this for us. All right, and uh, Cynthia, the compass is is right there in front of us as well. The smaller compass this week, so we could um, have space for our excellent FFA. And by the way, people often say to me, like, well, what does FFA stand for? And they explain it in in that very excellent short article and why it really is not okay to call it Future Farmers of America no. anymore. Yeah. But um, Peter Kaufman, an author from Lakeville, a very interesting guy, but also the father of one of our most beloved uh, summer interns, uh, Sophia Kaufman, who came back to us for many years and took a beautiful portrait of her dad. Peter, very interesting, uh, thoughtful guy, has a new book about um, truthiness and the media and this sort of this, this 21st century idea of the truth is what you make it. Um, in- interviewed by Fred Baumgarten, also a very interesting guy, and a, a deep, interesting conversation, the kind that you wish you could be sitting at the dinner table and listening to, and here's your chance. And, of course, Peter will be talking about his book and, on March 13th, which I'm happy to say is coming up pretty soon <laughs> as we as we race through uh, the end of winter into summer. And then Leela Hawken, um, speaking of uh, spring and summer and new plants, Bosco Shell and Paige Dickey, who live here in Falls Village, right around the corner from our office. Paige Dickey, a famous garden writer, and her husband, a famous book and magazine editor, um, talking about their greenhouse um, and how many of us are not daydreaming at this time uh, of having a little wonderful greenhouse. You know, the story about the FFA, I was when I was at interviewing uh, yesterday, interesting thing, when I was in high school, FFA was all about farming, okay? Yeah. But then about 15, 20 years ago, FFA became about agribusiness, which yeah. was which was a whole different aspect of it. And now it's not only agribusiness, it's agri-science. And the great thing that people don't realize, our local chapter has kept up with all those changes and adapted over the years. So they right they are right there on the firing line. It really is an amazing chapter. It really is. They've been leaders in yep. this movement. They're great. All right, well, those are some of the stories you'll find in the Lakeville Journal of this week. Uh, TricornerNews.com is the website, of course, uh, home delivery and at newsstands throughout the region. We'll speak to you guys next week. Right, and thank you so much. Tricorner Real Estate this week. It's in the paper. All right. Uh, That is this week in the Lakeville Journal here on Robin Hood Radio. And once again, TricornerNews.com is where you will find them.